very important part of the Women of Post and Shell, Carolyn Kendall. Hey, my name is Carolyn Kendall, and I'm a partner in the uh, White Collar and Internal Investigations Group. And I echo Putty's sentiments. I'm so glad you could join us tonight for what is one of my favorite events. I miss connecting with all of you in person, and I know I speak on behalf of all of the members of Post and Shell when I say that we look forward to celebrating with you next year in person. And now it is my true honor and pleasure to introduce my colleague, Liz Williams, a litigator in our professional liability group from the Philadelphia office, who will talk about tonight's speaker. Yeah, thank you so much, Carolyn and Puddy. Um, I'm just thrilled to introduce uh, Dr. Catherine High today. Um, she's the uh, co-founder, former president, and head of research and development at Spark Therapeutics, a Philadelphia-based company, where she led the development and regulatory approval of the first gene therapy for a genetic disease in the United States. Uh, this was for a drug called Luxterna, uh, which is a gene therapy for a form of hereditary blindness. Hopefully, we'll hear more about that today. Uh, look, she, she co-founded Spark Therapeutics in March of 2013, after spending 12 years as the director of the Center for Cellular and Molecular Therapeutics at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. She was also the head of hematology research at CHOP. Dr. High's research focused primarily on the use of gene therapy as a treatment for hemophilia, which was one of the central pieces that drew Roche to acquire Spark for $4.8 billion in 2020. She also served a five-year term on the FDA Advisory Committee on the Cell, Tissue, and Gene Therapies, and she is past president of the American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy. Dr. High is trained in internal medicine and hematology. She has a BA, an AB from chemistry, an AB in chemistry from Harvard University and an MD from the University of North Carolina, among other degrees. Currently, she is visiting professor at Rockefeller University, a graduate level private university that focuses on biological and medical sciences at the graduate and postgraduate level. This is in addition to her newest role as president therapeutics for Ask Bio a clinical stage gene therapy company and subsidiary of Bayer AG based in North Carolina. She also serves on the board of directors there. And in her new role, she is responsible for driving the strategic direction and execution of these clinical programs. The gene therapies are transforming patients' lives in ways that were unimaginable 20 years ago. With recent scientific advances, Commercial gene therapies have been met with exciting opportunities for treatment for previously untreatable genetic diseases. So with these advances come challenges, opportunities, new approaches to developing and delivering these kinds of medicines. So with that in mind, we're just thrilled to have Dr. High with us today. She's the leading authority on genomic research and development, one of them. And uh, we can't wait to hear her thoughts and experiences um, on this exciting topic today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liz. And uh, I have to say, Liz actually asked me to give this talk a year ago. <laughs> and uh, at the onset of COVID, it was, uh, it was postponed. So thank you very much, Liz, for inviting me back. And I thought what I would do this afternoon in the next few minutes is tell you a little bit about uh, gene therapy and tell you about my journey from academia to biotech. And then because it's Women's History Month, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, an organization that uh, I've been doing some work with uh, that's been trying to promote the number of women who, uh, who begin to look at uh, founding a biotech company. So I'm gonna show you first um, a little bit of background. So I, I'm calling this talk Gene Therapy Biotech and Women Entrepreneurs. So I hope you can all see my screen. Um, let me start out by telling you a little bit about gene therapy because uh, it, it's a new area of therapeutics, but when you think about the vaccines for 
uh, coronavirus, these are RNAs uh, in a lipid nanoparticle that are delivered, as you know, uh, into the arm and give you immunity to this uh, strange virus that's upended all of our lives over the last year. Uh, but viruses do other important things, and we've used them to make gene delivery vehicles. Uh, working at CHOP as I did beginning in 1992, uh, you get a strong feel when you walk through the wards there about unmet medical needs that are related to inherited diseases. And these are pictures of children with uh, a variety of different inherited diseases, cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia and muscular dystrophy. And although each of these are rare, in the aggregate, these rare genetic diseases affect about 25 million Americans. And one of the goals of the Human Genome Project, which started in 1990, was eventually to provide better treatment options for people who were born with serious genetic diseases by allowing us to give the gene as a treatment. And as it turned out, it, turned, it was a little more complicated to develop gene therapy than it is to think about doing it. <laughs> so basically, the way that gene therapy works is that, as you all remember, uh, you know, every cell has the same DNA, but only some of the DNA is transcribed into RNA, and that RNA is used to drive the production of protein. So the differences in transcription between one cell and the next cell is what makes, for example, a hair follicle different from a liver cell or a cell in the retina. And so that differential pattern of expression is what, what controls the proteins that come out, but all the cells have the same DNA. Um, so DNA is very long lived. It essentially is there for the lifetime of the cell, whereas RNA and protein, which can be thought of as action molecules, uh, have a half-life in hours. So a lot of what we do for therapeutics is use proteins, but then they have to be given repetitively. So for example, recombinant insulin or all ki different kinds of monoclonal antibodies that may be taken once a month or every two weeks uh, as a therapeutic. Uh, but the idea is, should be that if you could give DNA into a cell where you're normally expressing a gene that's missing or defective, that that could be a one-time treatment, so a once-and-done treatment. And so how do you give a piece of DNA? Well, you can't just give a piece of DNA that's rapidly destroyed in the environment of the cell, but if you can encase it in the outer shell of uh, a virus, uh, you can actually deliver it to a cell because viruses are very good at attaching to cells and then injecting their own DNA into the cell. And so then you can use that, uh, that engineered virus, which has uh, a human DNA on the inside, although it looks like a virus on the outside, to deliver the right piece of DNA to the right cell. So uh, you can think of this as the gene delivery vehicle, which is engineered from the virus, is like the envelope, and the gene is like the letter, and you know you eventually throw away the envelope, but the but the letter remains. You save the letter, and the letter is the gene. And now it's part of of the cell, uh, the cells of the person who who got the gene therapy. So this is the current state of gene therapy for genetic diseases. Um, there are six products that have been approved in either the United States or Europe. These two in the middle use the gene delivery vehicle that we were using at Spark, that I'm using at AskBio, and that is called AAV. And the first product approved in the United States was Luxterna, as you heard uh, Liz say, which is for a rare form of inherited blindness. And uh, the, as you see, uh, this was actually the first one approved by the FDA in the United States. Uh, and uh, you know, there's been steady progress since, uh, since then. So we began the work that eventually led us to Spark in our research group at the Children's Hospital in 1990s. And we were actually first doing gene transfer experiments in mice and then in uh, dog models of disease. 
And we encountered one problem after another that had to be solved until we could get to the first trials in humans. And we began human trials of gene therapy in 1999 at the Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia. And, you know, finding and identifying problems didn't end with the first clinical trial. As we conducted clinical trials, we identified more problems that we had to stop and solve before we could make further progress. And, uh, you know, after a while, I started to feel that, well, I'll, I'll probably never actually see a licensed product. I'm just going to keep solving problems. This became sort of my research lifestyle, uh, solving one problem, going on, and then hitting up against another one. And, and uh, you know, I, I began to write longer and longer research papers because I was trying to get in every single thing that I had learned in the course of the most recent clinical trial so that the next person could start off where I so could start out where I left off. Uh, but, you know, slowly, slowly, uh, our progress continued. In the late 1990s, I started collaborating with a biotech company in Northern California. And that was actually a very important and pivotal experience for me. I, I did that for uh, four or five years. And I learned a lot of important skills there. Uh, I learned how to talk to investors. Uh, one of the main pro programs that the company was pursuing was work that they were doing in collaboration with us at Children's Hospital. I learned a lot about news flow in the corporate sector. I learned how financing and news flow are, are related to each other. And one of the most important things I learned from the CEO of that company was that it's always important just to make good decisions for the programs. Don't worry about the stock price. And so that was a very valuable lesson, actually. However, um, I, I also had a tendency, I think, to focus very closely on what I was doing and not on what was happening around me. And in the late 90s and early 2000s, there were a series of high profile adverse events in other gene therapy trials. And that eventually had the effect of uh, leading to a broad retrenchment in interest in and funding for work in gene therapy. And so eventually this company that I'd been working with and they had been making our clinical grade vector so that we could do clinical trials, uh, couldn't raise money anymore and they had to get out of gene therapy. And uh, so, I mean, the, not only did investors lose interest, but uh, pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies also lost interest. And so, uh, you know, our own work was going well and I did not want to stop doing it. And eventually, um, so these were the kinds of headlines that you were reading about gene therapy in the early 2000s. Gene therapy still lacks a breakthrough. Gene therapy cursed or inching toward credibility. But it was really in that context that I had to go to the leadership of Children's Hospital and say, you know, um, I, I'm going to uh, need to set up vector production facilities in the hospital if we're going to keep our work going. All of these companies are going under. I can't collaborate with them anymore. Um, and so I, I went to the leadership of Children's Hospital and began to discuss this. And frankly, I, I felt that they would likely tell me that they could not <laughs> make investments in the programs that we were doing. But to my un, undying surprise, the CEO of the hospital then, uh, Steve Altshuler in 2004, agreed to commit resources to what we were doing and, and helped us establish a lot of the infrastructure that we needed to keep doing our work, despite the fact that most companies had turned away from it. And actually, we were very fortunate that we were able to recruit a number of the people that we had been working with in the biotech company in Northern California to come and work with us at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, this is Dr. Fraser Wright, who ran the vector production facility, Jennifer Wellman, who did a lot of the regulatory work on our programs at Children's Hospital, and Dr. Guang Chu, who developed a lot of the processes that were used in vector manufacturing. So uh, in retrospect, I, I, it was actually a good thing that, uh, that we uh, had to get people to commit to moving to Philadelphia. Uh, I realized uh, that that was actually a very good filter or test for how committed are, is somebody to the actual work that we were trying to do in gene therapy versus, you know, living in, in a great climate like Northern California. I did try to recruit people mostly in the spring and the fall, try to convince them that, you know, Philadelphia was a lot like San Francisco. Anyway, 
Um, these people really helped us build on what we had begun at Children's Hospital. And, uh, you know, it's a great privilege to work with the same group of people over a long period of time. And that's what we were able to do. And with the help of the people that we brought in and the people who were already working on our programs, we really built an infrastructure for conducting gene therapy trials. And, uh, and we made progress across a number of fronts, introducing our vector into different target tissues, skeletal muscle, liver, and the subretinal space or the back of the eye. And um, we worked together in our new center for about eight years. And I have to say, <laughs> Uh, you know, there were many ups and downs, there were many problems uh, encountered and solved. But then in the early 2011, 2012, we began to get, based on the work that we were doing, we started to get cold calls from investors. We got calls from Big Pharma uh, and from Big Biotech asking if they could partner on some of the programs that we were doing. And so uh, really fortunately for me, uh, the CEO of the hospital formed a subcommittee of the board to examine potential paths forward. Um, and one of the things that really triggered that was that our eye trial that eventually gave rise to Luxterna, this treatment for a rare and inherited form of blindness, went into late phase clinical testing at the hospital in 2012. We were actually doing it as a multi-site so it was happening at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and at the University of Iowa. And the CEO of the hospital, the one who had been such a great support, <laughs> called me into his office and said, uh, Dr. Howe, what exactly is your plan if this works? Because we're a hospital and we do not commercialize uh, products. <laughs> and so I knew that it was, you know, we, we really did need to talk about uh, how we were going to move forward. And I was afraid to commit our programs in hemophilia, in uh, congenital blindness, into the setting of a large pharmaceutical company because I was afraid that we would continue to encounter problems. And, and I, I felt that in the midst of a big company with many other programs competing for resources, you know, people may not be so committed to spending resources to solve one more problem in a gene therapy uh, clinical trial. Whereas if we put it all into a company that was really focused on gene therapy, you know, we would have to solve the problems or we weren't going to make it. So in March of 2013, Spark Therapeutics was formed and Children's Hospital of Philadelphia was actually our first investor. Um, so we, <laughs> um, we went through all the efforts of company formation. Uh, I actually had a very good position at Children's Hospital. I held an endowed chair there. I had funding from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, and I, I went through a lot of soul searching about what to do. But in the end, because gene therapy itself was so new, and there weren't really a lot of people who had experience working on it, I felt that uh, the safest things for these programs that I had spent many, many years working on would be if I went with them to the company. And so that was what I did. And, and uh, one of my old fellows told me after what to me was an agonizing decision process, she said to me very blithely, oh, I always knew you would go. And I said in an irritated, in an irritating, irritated way, how did you know? I didn't even know. And she said, because you're only happy on the steep part of the learning curve. And actually, I thought that was pretty insightful about what I like to do. Um, some of the initial investors that we talked to uh, after we got up and running made statements to us like, if you really want to start a biotech company, you need to be in Boston, San Francisco, or San Diego. But uh, of course, we were all very committed to being in Philadelphia, where uh, our clinical trials were taking place, and where we had spent literally decades uh, gathering together a group of people uh, who were really interested in moving this work forward. So I think nobody would say that to you now, but believe me, in uh, 2013, they were still saying that. Um, we were able to provide some other counter arguments. 
20% of the city's workforce in Philadelphia works in the healthcare sector, and one out of every six U.S. doctors has received medical training here. Uh, and the, the city, and particularly the University of Pennsylvania and Children's Hospital, had a great deal of grant funding in the area of gene therapy. So we made our case and we stuck to our guns that we were going to stay in Philadelphia. Um, we recruited a very uh, dynamic young uh, CEO, Jeff Morazzo, who was a Wharton MBA and had worked with Dr. Altshuler uh, when he was still a student at the Wharton School. He was uh, shadowing boards. He had also gotten a master's in public policy from the Kennedy School. So he had been a joint uh, Wharton Kennedy School graduate. And uh, he was one of the first employees to come on board. And, uh, you know, together we uh, moved the programs forward, raised, uh, raised funds to keep all that going. And uh, if you just look at the top here, this was our first footprint in West Philadelphia, 38th and Market Street. We had 28,000 square feet and we had everything there. R&D, commercial, technical operations, corporate functions, uh, everything was in one floor. Uh, over the next four years, we went from, uh, you know, beginning with about 30 people to over 300 uh, with lots of different uh, space in West Philadelphia. Uh, we did go public in January of 2015. So here we are at the ringing of the bell at NASDAQ. And, you know, Liz summarized a number of these things, but late in 2019, we had over 400 employees, most of them based in Philadelphia. Um, Luxterna had become the first licensed gene therapy for genetic disease in the United States, treatment for a rare form of congenital blindness. Our, the product that we had developed for hemophilia B was entering phase three testing, uh, and uh, it was sponsored now by Pfizer, who had acquired the program after uh, the phase one, two studies had been completed at Spark. And uh, we had garnered a number of other um, important milestones suggesting that we knew what we were doing in drug development. Uh, and Spark actually won a prize, uh, the pre Gallien for best biotechnology product in 2019. This is part of the Star Spark team uh, cheering at the banquet that's held at the Museum of Natural History in New York uh, to give out the pre Gallien awards uh, uh, every year in October. So um, I'm going to switch gears uh, in just a minute. I'll, I'll, I'll say this is a quote from Dr. Azam, who's the CEO of Teamunity, another uh, gene therapy company that was uh, set up uh, a few years after Spark. And I think uh, now, I, I think I'm, I'm very impressed that nobody, as I said before, nobody would tell you now that you couldn't start a biotech company in Philadelphia. I think it's, uh, it's become a place with many people employed in the biotech industry uh, in the city. Whereas when we were looking for space, we actually needed vector production space. And we found out that within the city limits, there was none available we were gonna to have to build it because there was none that we could go out and rent. So that wouldn't be the case now. So um, let me say that uh, I, I wanna to talk to you now, shift gears and talk a little bit about women in biotech. And I, I, I'm gonna show you a series of statistics that I was really glad I didn't know about when I embarked on this adventure. Um, <laughs> and you know, it did become obvious to me after I moved from Children's Hospital into the world of biotech that it was, uh, it was an area where women are far more scarce in leadership positions than they are at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And uh, so over the last several years, a group in Boston that was started by three women professors at MIT, uh, two of whom had founded companies, uh, began to compile statistics. And th they looked first at their own institution, MIT, and at the Boston area where they worked, uh, noting that in 2016, fewer than 2% of startup companies were founded by women. And most of the people who make the funding decisions are also mostly men of venture capital principles. Only 8.4% were women. 
Um, they, they noted a very interesting study by members of the Harvard, Harvard Business School faculty who observed 140 interviews of venture capitalists with uh, prospective uh, founders of companies who are trying to raise money. And one of the main conclusions from those observations was that venture capitalists tend to ask male entrepreneurs about all the ways their company can succeed, while they tend to ask women entrepreneurs about all the ways that they could fail. And uh, one of the conclusions in the article is that there is an over-reliance on a sort of faulty thinking uh, based on pattern recognition that most founders in the past have been men, so most successful startups are led by men, and so the safe bet is to, bet is to invest in men. So um, what the Boston Biotech Working Group uh, crafted as a, as a solution that they thought was practical after spending time with venture capitalists, uh, with biotech companies, was to try to make as an initial goal engaging more women on scientific advisory boards and boards of directors uh, to try to give more women opportunities to see how companies are actually formed and run and also making connections of women with potential investors. And so some of the work that they did, I won't mention the names of these companies, but two well-known Boston area biotechs. And if they looked at their founding advisors, directors, and top management, they were, they were essentially all men. They tried to look more broadly at 18 different biotech companies uh, in Boston, 223 men and eight women among the founders, directors, and scientific advisory board members. So uh, they have made some progress. In 2020, there was a pledge signed by five venture firms active in their area that they would try to ensure that the boards of directors for companies where they hold positions of power based on their investment uh, would be at least 25% women by the end of 2022. And actually Goldman Sachs announced in January 2020 that they will not take public any company that has an all male board. And MIT actually founded a boot camp for women interested in starting companies. And part of what motivated MIT to do that was that uh, when they looked at their own statistics from 2000 to 2018, MIT faculty founded 250 biotech companies. Only 10% of those had women founders, but the relevant departments, which were engineering, biomedical engineering, biology, were 22% uh, women. And so they felt that there were really companies that were missing. Um, okay, so will these solutions work to increase the number of women entrepreneurs? I don't know the answer to that. Um, certainly, the number of women in boardrooms, as probably all of you know, are increasing. And these are data from uh, a report by Spencer Stewart about the number of uh, women who were um, appointed to, um, to boards over the last uh, couple of years. And so we see many more women being appointed. Uh, I don't know whether that's because of uh, policies like the one announced by Goldman Sachs. Uh, but at any rate, as I said before, I was glad that I didn't know all these things when I um, <laughs> set out to participate in the founding of Spark. Uh, but I, I, I thought that uh, I was in a good position. I knew very well the business that I was trying to uh, get funding for. And I felt that Generally, our reception from investors was pretty positive, well, whether that was because I was accompanied by a male CEO and a male, male chief financial officer, both graduates of the Wharton School, I don't know, and I won't be able to figure out that experiment. Uh, but um, I think that things are definitely changing. I think it's good that people are getting together uh, to find facts and figures and try to change the directions uh, that have prevented more women from being founders. And so I think I'm gonna stop there and uh, I'll, I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you for your attention. Hi, this is the operator. If you'd like to ask any questions of Dr. High, uh, please either use the raise hand option in your Zoom browser or type into the Q&A window. Both are located at the bottom 
of your screen. Well, I don't know if this will work. And Dr. High, thank you so very much for sharing this fascinating story of your progress in your life. Um, I am not in any way a scientist, but I just am amazed that you were able to stay with it. What do you think was the reason that you could just continue and not get discouraged? Well, of course, there are uh, limited successes along the way, and I think you take, uh, you take uh, great uh, enthusiasm when, some, when you solve a problem. It, it generates a lot of enthusiasm for moving forward. Um, and I, I have to honestly say, I worked with terrific people, and, uh, you know, the creativity and innovation and resourcefulness in solving problems large and small. Um, and so, I, and of course, I really, really, really believed in the work. I think that, uh, you know, I, I feel that in some ways I was probably, I think we're all influenced by our history. My father died when he was a, a young man in his 40s of a condition that he was born with. And I think that, uh, that that really fueled my motivation to make a difference. Uh, and um, I, I think that uh, getting all the way to an approved product was, uh, was an experience that I knew was important. I knew having been involved in medicine over many years was an important milestone. But the thing that really amazed me is that it took us 10 years from the first clinical trial of the drug that became Luxterna until it was approved. It was 10 years. Uh, and in the first year after the drug was approved, more people were treated with the drug than in the 10 years when we were trying to develop it in our clinical trials. So uh, that, that gave me sort of awe of the uh, commercial enterprise of the biotech and pharmaceutical industry, right? That if you get the drug approved, they really can get it out to patients. And then it really makes a difference in people's lives. Wow, it's amazing. Thank you again. And I guess there are a lot of questions, Paul. How do you want to handle that? I can, I can read them aloud for you and you can answer them one by one. Is that okay, Dr. Hunt? Okay, sure. Uh, we have one from Jessica Rogers said, thanks for the great talk. How can we support more women in biotech? Well, <laughs> I guess you can look for people like, like me who don't look around them and don't really realize that there are a lot of obstacles. <laughs> no, I, um, I think that the work that's going on through the Boston Biotech Working Group to try to promote the number of women who are involved in companies, uh, I, I can imagine that that would have a payoff. I mean, I think that for me, if I hadn't been closely involved with that company in Northern California in the late 1990s and really learned from, from my collaborators and colleagues there, a lot of things about the rhythm of corporate life that you might not know if you spend all your time in academia, uh, but getting sort of uh, de demystified about all of those things uh, made a difference for me when in 2012, it really became clear that the work that we were doing was absolutely going to require a company if it was going to go all the way uh, to become products that were available for patients. And so I, I think that that's actually a good thing uh, that they're trying to do, trying try to get more women on scientific advisory boards and on boards of directors. Uh, and that, I, I think that that will have a positive effect. It certainly did for me. Okay, our next question is from Ron Levine. 
uh, he wanted to know what your experience with lawyers was for me. <laughs> wow. I learned that they are super, super, super important in many aspects of, uh, of setting up a company, of course, uh, you know, uh, at Children's Hospital, just beginning with Children's Hospital, right? There were many issues around conflict of interest and those all had to be sorted out uh, and wrapped up as we moved to the company. Of course, they were incredibly important in the whole issue of going public. Uh, the um, people that we worked with to write the S1 and, and then to go, you know, to go through all the parts on the roadshow and so forth. And then of course, they, they're just very, very important. Uh, we, we had a great uh, general counsel at uh, Spark and he was there from the very early days and he had experience in biotech. So, uh, and of course, soon after uh, the company was formed, we went public. So then you have all the issues around a publicly traded company. And of course, very, very important, the patent lawyers. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and again, we worked with terrific people um, for uh, issues around patents at uh, Spark. Uh, so, you know, they're actually a much bigger part of daily life in biotech than they are in academia, uh, but uh, a critical part. Thankfully, uh, I heard Carolyn introduce herself. I, I, I don't think we had any white uh, collar criminal work going on, but <laughs> anyway. Okay, uh, next question we have is, um, there seems to be significant anti-science movement in America right now. Mm. Do you see that having any effect on in how the biotech industry operates? Well, you're touching on a very important point, but I think I could also say there seem to be important anti-civics lessons uh, as a current in modern America, for example. And, I, you know, I think that really that comes from uh, less than stellar results in the educational system, right? I mean, everyone should be exposed to science as part of their education. Everyone should be exposed to uh, particip participatory democracy and its principles as part of their education. Um, so, uh, I don't have the answer to your question. I mean, there are no shortage of young people applying to study science in graduate school and in medical school. Uh, there, there's certainly not a shortage of individuals who are interested, but, um, you know, and, and I'll tell you this, I talked to a lot of patient organizations in the work that I do explaining gene therapy, explaining how it works, explaining which patients are eligible and which patients aren't and so forth. And, you know, I think among people who really want to know from all walks of life, uh, you know, people can become interested and learn. But uh, I, can't, I can't answer your question about why, you know, why are some people opposed to vaccines, for example, <laughs> right? Would they rather get a bad disease or take a vaccine? <laughs> no. But, but yes, that, that exists. Uh, do you see there, is there a pipeline problem in getting more women into biotech? Well, I think that what the statistics that I showed at the end uh, suggests is that women may get doctoral degrees and they may join faculties and they may do great research, but they may not think about translating their work to the next step and, uh, you know, again, as I found out when I moved to biotech, it's, uh, it's much more male dominated field than, for example, medicine um, or university faculties. And, uh, you know, some people find that not, uh, not a very hospitable environment. And, you know, we can only hope that over time things change just as they've changed a great deal over my professional career in medicine and probably for many of you as well in law. 
but biotech is one of those things that just seems to have gone a little more slowly, right? I don't, I don't know why. There's certainly many women working in biotech companies. And, and the difference is that they're, as you go up in the company there, there are relatively fewer and fewer women. Um, why did you focus on orphan diseases at first versus more widespread? Ah, that's a really good question. And here's the answer. You know, uh, if you look at the approved gene therapies that we have now, um, they're almost all, that, well, they are all for single gene disorders. And, the, and they're all approved on very small numbers of patients, like always less than 100. Luxterna was approved on 41 patients, a trial of 41 patients. So what that tells you is that if you're missing a gene and we can figure out how to put that missing gene into the right target tissue, you will get very clear cut dramatic results. And therefore, you don't need a big trial. So when you look at much more common diseases like heart failure or Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's, these, these are complicated diseases that mostly are not due to a single gene disorder. Now, do I believe that we can develop a genetic strategy to treat or improve those diseases? Yes, I do. And I'm excited to say that we're working on that uh, at Ask About, but I do believe it will be a more complicated situation than just a single gene disorder where if you can replace that gene, you can you know, bring the person to a different level of health based on that. So it's a harder problem is the short answer. <laughs> it's a harder problem than a single gene disorder, but you know, one thing at a time. So. Well, thank you. Um, I'm not showing any additional questions unless anyone had another. Oh, I have another question. How did the name Spark and the company logo come about? Oh my gosh. You know, we, <laughs> we were working with the communications consultant on selecting a, a name and we kept making lists and, and, uh, you know, we, we wanted to somehow encapsulate the, the uh, thinking of that, you know, you transfer in this gene and then a new, uh, a new thing unfolds, right? So we thought of names like chrysalis and so forth and so on. And then uh, the CEO of Jeff Morazzo said, it has to be one or two syllables. It can't be chrysalis, right? That's too long. So <laughs> I guess these are the things you learn in business school, right? So, um, we considered many, many different names and we could, it was very hard to come to a decision. And finally, I think I realized, you know what? It, it doesn't matter that much. I mean, we have to make it mean something, right? It, it, if we don't do good work, it won't ever be important. But if we do do good work, then, that, then the, the title, the name will be an important name. And so I, I think after a while, we sort of let go of finding the perfect name and came up with one that we liked. And I, I think Spark also embodies the idea of, you know, a, a spark, the gene, which then gives rise to something better uh, in terms of the patient's health. And the logo, I mean, honestly, I don't even remember that. I remember many discussions over the name. <laughs> I'm not a very visual artistic person. Um, do you think that the reliance on venture capitalists rather than other options for funding medical companies has an impact on what ultimately comes to market? Well, I think that that's certainly true, right? I mean, we were fortunate. Our first funder was the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And I think that the way that they thought about that was, well, okay, we have an endowment. We invest part of our endowment. We put it at risk. And here's a technology that we know very, very well. And we, it's grown up in our four walls and we could invest in this. Um, and so we were not really trying to raise our initial capital from venture capital. So, you know, we, by the time we went out to raise money, as I said, our, our lead asset was already in phase three. <laughs> and so, you know, one of our, I remember an interview with a banker who said something like, uh, I don't usually see people coming in here trying to raise capital who already have an asset in phase three. So 
I mean, we were fortunate that we were able to develop a lot of the work inside the four walls of a uh, children's hospital before we needed to raise money. And, I, you know, I, I think that the, a lot of the people in venture capital are actually very, very, very well informed physicians and scientists who are, who are good at their job of appraising uh, things that come in front of them and determining what they think is the likelihood of success and then trying to help the company get there through early participation on the board. So, uh, you know, I've been generally impressed with the people that I, I met who are working in, in venture capital. Um, do they, well, I mean, I think, you know, part of, part of what the Boston Biotech Working Group is saying is that, uh, uh, there's probably some element of being affected by what people know by pattern recognition. And does that make things a little more difficult for women uh, founders? Um, Robin Nagel would like to know where you see gene therapy going in the next 10 to 15 years. Oh, well, okay. That's a great question. Uh, you know, I think that the, uh, first of all, we're getting more and better gene delivery vehicles. And some of those, I think, will eventually be non-viral. So all the issues that we had to worry about because of the human immune response to our vector, you know, won't be an issue if we can really get good non-viral gene delivery vehicles. I think that better and better knowledge of biology uh, will allow us to be successful for some of these complex acquired disorders like heart failure, like Alzheimer's, uh, you know, so using a gene-based strategy to make, to make better clinical outcomes in those diseases. I think we will continue to see uh, gene editing taking place. That's already been successful clinically. So this is where, you know, instead of trying to give somebody a new gene, you actually go in and try to edit the genes that are already there that's already been successful. Not, it's not a licensed product yet, but it's shown successful clinical results in sickle cell disease. And uh, this year, of course, uh, gene editing, the, the two people who developed it won the Nobel Prize in chemistry, Jennifer Doudna and uh, Emmanuel Charpentier. Um, and by the way, both of them founded companies. <laughs> so things maybe really are changing. Um, and uh, so I think, that we, I think that gene therapy will become uh, a, a much more um, extensively utilized uh, uh, class of therapeutics. So of course, of course I'm gonna say that, but I think I'm right. <laughs> uh, next question is from uh, Marlene Baldinger. She notes, I, it was an outstanding and phenomenally inspiring presentation. She has two young daughters interested in medicine and the arts who were born through IVF. Are there any applications in your research and technology that would apply to this continuously evolving area of medicine? Well, that is a really interesting question. And I, I mean, again, uh, to me, um, that will be a more challenging area of application, but not outside the pale. I mean, I do have to say this parenthetically, we had a great chief commercial, uh, sorry, chief medical officer at Spark, Dr. Kathleen Reap, and she was trained as an OBGYN. And when I interviewed her, she had extensive experience uh, across many different therapeutic areas. Uh, but I thought, okay, but this is what, no, her background is in OBGYN. We're not going to develop any products in OBGYN, you know, it, but here's what I learned over time working with her. You know, what's great about training in obstetrics and gynecology, <laughs> you learn to make decisions really fast. You don't have time to stand around. You got to know now what you're going to do in the delivery room. Um, you, uh, you know, it, 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 she had a lot of traits that make a really good chief medical officer. And uh, so will we have products for obstetric, uh, obstetrics and gynecology folks? Well, uh, I'm not sure that I see that right away, but it's a good question, Marlene. Uh, Mariel Marsh uh, asks, what was your greatest challenge along the way and how did you overcome it? 
The greatest challenge? Um, well, I, I can remember times when I felt really, really, really discouraged. Uh, and, you know, I, I feel very, very fortunate in some ways that, you know, to me, it was always important that our work would be very safe. And I, I would rather uh, go slower, but make sure that everything was safe. And I, I feel very fortunate that for us so far and everything we've done, that that has been an important hallmark of what we've done. Um, and I think I would get really discouraged uh, when people didn't have a good outcome. So they volunteered for our trial and we were doing the best that we knew at the time, but they didn't get the kind of of result that we were hoping for. And, you know, that was just a reality of some of the early work that we did. Uh, for example, in hemophilia trials, the person would uh, express the clotting factor and be free of bleeding episodes, and it would last for a couple of months and then it would go away. Well, you know, I mean, that, that, was, that was very, very discouraging. And there were times that I did uh, feel like giving up and then it made a big difference to me that uh, patients and their families uh, were really encouraging and, and wanted us to you know, reach for something better. And they were very effective at communicating that when, when you spend time talking with them. And I, so I think that was one thing that made me keep going. And uh, you know, I have to say, I was very grateful to my family, my, husband and my three children who, who, you know, were, I, I, they were very, very understanding people uh, about, uh, about how passionately I was devoted to what I was doing and, and how much it meant to me. And, uh, you know, they, they made sacrifices on my behalf. Um, so I think all of those things uh, made me keep going. I, I had great mentors. I was lucky about that too. Uh, and uh, just so I had people that I could talk to when I got discouraged. And, um, I, and there were certainly many moments like that. Um, but again, having great colleagues, having, you know, really believing in what you do, feeling like if I can get this solved, it's going to be important. You know, all those things, uh, I think, um, made me keep going. What keeps you going? <laughs> Uh, next question is from John Joseph. Did Spark put in policies that encourage participation of women or try to recruit women scientists? And how did Spark deal with male bias in the <laughs> Oh dear. That's a that's a complicated question. You know, I've had great colleagues that are men and great colleagues that are women. Um, I was very fortunate to work work all those years at Children's Hospital. I, you know, I trained in internal medicine when I did it. it was, there were not many women in internal medicine. Now there are many more. Um, but when I moved to Children's Hospital and you know, there are a lot of women who are in pediatrics and uh, you know, it was just, it was sort of a freeing atmosphere for me. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I think it sort of fueled something that I have, which is uh, I feel, you know, even to this day and I, I I don't mean this in any way, in a negative way about men colleagues, because I have a lot of great men colleagues. But, you know, I always feel really comfortable with women uh, as colleagues. And, and, you know, we were fortunate that we had a number of women in leadership positions at, uh, at Spark as well. I mentioned that chief medical officer uh, and our head of HR. So, um, you know, and I, I used to host a dinner uh, periodically at Spark for all the senior women in the organization, just so that we could get together and, and uh, talk about our experiences and validate each other's experiences and, um, and uh, how can you make things better? I mean, I, you know, try to be fair and unbiased in your hiring practices, I guess. I <laughs> not showing any additional questions unless anyone had anything else they'd like to ask.
All right. Well, my only regret is that I'm doing this in a year when I can't uh, go and have a reception with all of you in person. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. High. I know everybody really enjoyed your talk, me especially. Yeah, we did. Thank you for sharing so <laughs> candidly with us. It was great to hear and very inspiring. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, Dr. High. And as a token of our appreciation, I know that we're, we're going to make a, a donation to the um, Episcopal Community Services for you, which is just a fantastic organization. So thank you so much. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. High and everyone. And hopefully you'll be in Philadelphia next year and we'll get to celebrate you in person. <laughs> okay, thank you very great. much. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening.